34 this morning. It's all about him and bringing glory to his name this morning. To God be the glory. Let's do that this morning. Number 44 in your majesty hymnals. Give everybody a chance to get up here. Those of you online this morning, I trust you have a hymn book and you can sing along with us at home. To God be the glory. Number 44 in the majesty hymnal this morning. All right, let's lift it up this morning. Number 44. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. To love he so true this morning great things he hath done he deserves all our glory and praise this morning all right let's turn over to hymn number 134 134 a great old hymn by charles wesley that really pay attention to these words this morning it'll be a blessing to your heart and can it be 134 and can
I trust the words of that song are a blessing to your heart this morning. Let's take our newsletter this morning and look at some birthdays. We got quite a few today, or this week, I should say. Starting with today on the 21st, we have Shane Rice. Then on the 22nd, we have several. We, it's Well, it's a Pitts week here. It is, isn't it? You got a lot here. We start with John Pitts. And then on the, also on the 22nd, we have Asa Medlock, Ethan Lucky, Levi Stamper, and Josiah Alm. On the 23rd, we have Emmett Mainers. And then here goes the Pitts. The 24th, Sarah Pitts. The 25th, Ralph Pitts. The 26th, Carolina Pitts. And then on the 27th, Rick Lime. So happy birthday to all of them this morning. Let's sing to them. Happy birthday to you, to Jesus we true. God bless you and keep you the whole year through. Two anniversaries to mention this morning. Rick and Becky Glim on the 24th. How many years? Ten? Ten? All right, let's give them a hand this morning. Ten years. And where's Ben at this morning? I don't. Ben, are you here? Ben and Amanda Kelly. I don't. Uh, maybe they're out celebrating this week. So I don't see them this morning. But let's uh, congratulate them as well on a happy anniversary. And let's sing to these folks this morning. Happy anniversary to you, to Jesus be true. God bless you and keep you. There's a, several things here I'll just quickly go through on our, on our uh, list. On the 27th, don't forget that we have Camp Joy Cleanup. You know what? I'm going to need bifocals here soon. I am having a hard time reading this. <laughs> Camp Joy Cleanup at 9 a.m. Uh, also, of course, coming up this week is uh, Camp Meeting from the 26th on the 26th. I can't see them with, that, with or without glasses this morning. I don't know what's going on here. Let's try this. There we go. <laughs> Look at bad folks. Uh, all right. So also, <laughs> camp meeting on the 26th, uh, 27th. And you all know about that. It's, we got breakfast. We got services. That's going to be a wonderful time. And be in much prayer this week about that. On the 29th. I think what it is is the colors here are clashing with my eyes. Um, there's <laughs> I'm trying to find a good excuse to this. <laughs> Memorial Day picnic on the 29th. Don't forget that and bring a turtle. We saw one yesterday. We were out hiking and we saw one and we said, well, it's kind of too early to grab one now. Hopefully we'll find another one before then. But find your turtles for the turtle, famous turtle races we have every year. On June 8th to the 10th is the ladies retreat and then uh, on June 20th we have a baby shower for Whitney James and baby boy. So put that on your calendar. I think that's everything. Just remind the choir this morning that we will be singing from our choir folders this morning. So be prepared for that after the greeting time. All right, let's sing another hymn this morning. Uh oh. You're just having a good time over there? Well, <laughs> praise the Lord. A little bit of confusion going on around here, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. Her name is Whitney Gilbert. Did, oh, oh, did we get it wrong? You read that wrong. <laughs> did I read that? It was it, well, now, wait a minute here. My eyes are seeing this, and it says Whitney James. <laughs> Let's sing again and get away from this thing. <laughs> Now, before we sing this, before we start, I'd like to do something a little different today with this. I trust it will be a blessing to you. You may have heard sometimes when singing, people are singing, on a final verse, they'll change the key and just kind of lift it up to a higher level. And I think on this song, it would be good to do that this morning. We'll sing number, verse number three, a cappella, without music. And then Brother Joel this morning is going to give a little interlude after that and raise to a higher key. And we'll just finish the hymn off uh, just joyfully and triumphantly this morning. All right. So we're going to try that and have a little fun with it. You need a page number? Okay. <laughs> I thought you could read my mind by now. Uh, Lord help me this morning. 
<laughs> 478, does that help? 478 this morning. Uh, I think the Lord sometimes likes us to have a little joy and laughter, and that's what's happening right now. But on the other hand, this is a pretty serious song we're going to sing. So, 478, It Is Well With My Soul. You probably don't even need your hymn books, a lot of you, for this one. It is well with my soul. All right, let's sing it out to the Lord this morning. When peace like a this morning and then we'll stand for the final stanza and change keys all right let's see how that goes this morning on the third my sin oh the bliss of this glorious thought my sin oh the bliss of this it is well with your soul this morning. Have a word of prayer with someone, then greet each other, and then we'll have our Bible reading.
Dan Friend come and lead us in our scripture reading this morning. Gonna, I'd love to hear you all visiting. I'm so glad you're here. We got a lot going on. We got to keep this bus moving down the road. <laughs> Amen. But I, I appreciate everybody visiting. And tonight we're going to be outside in the tabernacle. And uh, I really want you to come tonight. A dear friend of mine, uh, Brother Gary Hanger, is going to give his testimony. And uh, for about 10, 15 minutes, Gary uh, is a sawmill timber man, uh, lumber man, business man for many, many years in this country. A few years ago, he got hit with a horrendous stroke. And I mean, he was one of them guys that go like 90 mile an hour, work hard, tough. And that stroke knocked him for three dozen loops. And his testimony about God's grace during all of this, it just blessed my heart. And I mean, tell you, the devil tried to knock him out. But his attitude is just one. It'll encourage you. If you're going through a hard time, it'll encourage you. And it'll give you wisdom and discernment about how to handle when the hard times hit you. And uh, he hasn't given up. He still, he barely can get around. But he gets out and he does what he can do. And uh, boy, I tell you, he's a blessing. I hope you'll be for that. But we'll be outside. Now, I was, come here, Brother Danny, just a second. Sister Connie, would you come up here again? We didn't get this done the other night. Come on, Sister Connie. We're going to get this over with you. This couple has been in this church since just before Methuselah died. <laughs> and uh, they are absolutely servants of the Lord. And uh, bro, Don Zinn, where are you about back here? Don Zinn called me up here a while back and said, Reggie, we, some have been told we think church will send you and Karen on a trip. Well, me and Karen don't need no trip. But, but <laughs> I want to tell this couple right here, they just serve so, you cannot believe what a blessing they've been in this church. And I would like the church to do something really special for them. Send them on a trip. Do something for them. You let us know what you want to do. But we want to say thank you to you guys for being such a blessing to this church and all that you do and have done down through the years. Every pastor in America, if they had people like this, I tell you what, it'd be a blessing. And that ain't no joke. And I just want you to know we love you. So, let me ask you this. Would you rather have a trip or just cash? Well, <laughs> the trip that I want to take can't be bought with money. Yeah. It's oh, already been bought with the blood. Oh, okay. All right. Amen. And, and besides, besides that, yeah, you see us doing things. But there's a whole army of people that helps us do it. I know it. So I it wouldn't it. be right for us to go somewhere and not the whole army. So... Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we want you, you to know we love you, Danny, yep. and and, my, you. and I appreciate you so much. He's going to lead us in scripture reading. Let's stand together. What chapter, Danny? Twenty-seven. Acts twenty-seven. Acts 27. Let's stand and read the word of God together today. Now, listen, our projector deal is down today. We don't have it up on the wall, so you just look over. Somebody's got a Bible. Read Amen. All right, Acts chapter twenty-seven. We'll read responsively through this chapter. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy. They delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And on the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul, and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia and came to Myra, a city of Lycia, and when many days, but and and when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce had come over against Sidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salome. Now when much time was spent, and when the sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, I have seen that this voyage will be referred and much damaged, not only of the lady and the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the 
And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind for all Morocco. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into quickstands, strike sail, and so were driven. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when the sun or stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss in any man's life among you, but the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. But when the fourteenth day night was come, and as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And sounded and found it twenty fathoms, and when they had gone a little further, they sounded again, and found it fifteen fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers fell off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. And when and we were in all, in, and we were in all in the ship two hundred threescore and sixteen souls. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship before ground, aground. And the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose, and commanded that they should cast that, that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. Thank you. you. may be seated. I just want to let you know this song, Pastor Reg uh, brought this back when he came back from Philadelphia, um, and it's called Life Again. I'm asking the choir to pay very close attention to their dictation this morning because I really want you to get you the words to this song. They're really good. Life Again.
security. Bring that board down and erase that on the theory, right? Thank you so much. What well, a blessed song. We'll try to get that up on the board so the congregation can learn it and sing it too. Uh, again, tonight at 7 o'clock, we'll be meeting outside. And I think there'll be enough chairs. If you want to bring a lawn chair that you feel comfortable in, you're welcome to do that. But I think we should be able to get enough chairs. Isn't that an amazing group of young people? Amen. I tell you, you talk about a blessing. You ought to just shout to praise God for the young people in this church. Amen. And again, I want to say something this morning. just very moving to me. I got out of my truck out here on the ball field this morning and just glanced over into the tabernacle area. And there was, I don't know, six or seven, eight young men on their knees praying. I want to encourage you, maybe you teenage girls ought to start a prayer group. Maybe you have, and I don't know about it. I didn't know about that, but I appreciate them young men being out there praying this morning. I said, there ain't no way the devil going to stop us with, you know, we got young men praying like that. Uh, boy, I tell you, I'm excited about camp meeting. I believe that Brother Ronnie and Brother Larry are excited, and we're hoping, pray for Brother Mike Hogger that he can be here. He's just went through surgery, and uh, pray for him. Uh, but we're excited about all the folks coming. And we've got folks already started drifting in from the east. The car is over there this morning. How, how many people? We've got, we got people from Iowa over there, right? And I think there's some Iowans back in here. And we've got people from Arizona back here. And uh, anyway, maybe someplace else. I don't know. But I'll tell you what. I'm glad you're here. Now, this morning, I want you to take your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23. And we're going to continue preaching on this subject of the Feast of the Lord and how they apply to our lives. Leviticus chapter 23. And we're going to read a passage of scripture too, and then we're going to head in. And again, this morning, the scriptures won't be up on the wall because the uh, situation is down, not able to do that. Hopefully next uh, Sunday or whenever we'll be able to do that. But God ordained feast for his people, seven of them. And uh, I tell you, God wants you to enjoy your salvation. Amen. Amen. And boy, what I'm going to preach on this morning is the critical to is, the devil's got so many people messed up that if you get this truth, you can't help but get saved. I'm telling you, if you get this truth this morning, it'll blow away all them devil's lies and religious lies and God will help you. Now, when we, before we read this morning, I want to go through this thing again, that this feast was set up on a, on a, on a during the year. And uh, let's try to see if we can get something better than that. But the first one was, was Passover. And that was when they were to bring the lamb, of, the lamb and uh, they were to slay that lamb. And put his uh, blood upon the doorpost of their home. And they're in Egypt. And God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And this Passover feast had to do with salvation and redemption. All right. And I want to say something to you. If you're here today or you're listening online or whatever. The only way you can be saved is through the blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. This was back when they were in Egypt. When you come up to the cross. When you come up to the cross. John the Baptist looked at Jesus Christ and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Now I want to tell you how I know I'm saved. Because the Lamb of God shed his blood for me and I place my faith in that. And God saves you on the basis of your faith. You can't buy salvation, earn it, be good enough for it. It is a gift. It is free. It's forever. Amen. And God saves you, wash away your sins, make you his son and save you. And so that's what Passover is about. That was on the 14th of the month. Then on the 15th, we had the unleavened bread. And that is this. That feast represented that after you get saved, God wants you to live clean. Amen. It has to do with an, a holy walk. People are afraid of the word holy in, in, in these days. Holy means separated unto the Lord. You know, you can live in a monastery, but that don't mean you're holy. You can live in a cabin back in Montana. That don't mean you're holy. God, God wants you to do is be set after you're saved. And by the way, I just want to go over this again. If you've never been saved, let me tell you how to get saved right where you're sitting right now. You look up to God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to agree with you that I'm a wicked sinner and I deserve hell. I'm guilty. But I want to place my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ shed blood. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if you receive him right where you are right now, Pray to God. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God will save you right where you're at. You may think that you have to come up here and kneel on an altar. Well, I don't know why it's up to you, but I'll tell you what. God save a thief on the cross. He can save you sitting in the seat. Amen. God say, I've seen people saved everywhere. Airplanes, milk barns, everywhere. Vehicles out all over the grounds of this church. Back of the church. 
I'll tell you, when you get saved, when you come to grips with the truth that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And I got saved on January the 24th, 1982, and I've never been the same since. And I'm not sinless, and you won't be sinless. That's why I needed a Savior. Amen. Don't you buy into this junk about that. Don't you tell them. This is the sorriest bunch of people in the country. This is the first church of the salvage yard. <laughs> Amen. We're not a bunch of holier than thou's. We're saved by the grace of God. Amen. But when God saves you, he takes you out of Egypt. And he'll take you out of this world. Don't you get in your head, well, I'm going to get saved. I'm just going to still live in Egypt. No, that ain't the way it works. You get saved, God will take you out of Egypt. And he'll give you a new way to live. I don't live like I used to live. And this unleavened bread speaks of a holy walk. And God will take a bunch of junk out of your life. And he'll say, I want that out. And he'll take it out. Going down the road and more as you move. And I'm 69 years old. Been saved 40 some years. God's still taking junk. There's some junk called anger that God's still trying to take out of my life. Yes, sir. And I ain't going to tell you the rest of it. <laughs> but that's me and God business. Amen. But don't you think you're going to be sinless because you got saved? You're still going to have that same old flesh and nature, just rotten as ever was. But I tell you, make your child of God that he'll birth a new man in you. When God saves you, there's a new creation, a new man created and born of the spirit of God. And God will save you. Now, after he saves you, he wants you to get in that book and live by that book. And if you live by that book, you'll have a holy walk and you'll be a light and salt to other people. And by the way, it'll be a blessing to you. Don't mean you're going to be rich and famous. Don't mean you're going to be healthy and wealthy. But you got a home in heaven. And your sins are forgiven. You're reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Then last week, on, uh, uh, on the, I had the, uh, on the, I'm sorry, fifth, 40, anyway, we had the, what was last week? I came, first fruits. Last week we had first fruit. First fruit speaks of Jesus' resurrection. All right? Jesus was raised on the third day. So it speaks of his resurrection. It speaks of his death on the cross, of his, his sinless life, his resurrection. Then the next feast was the feast of Pentecost. All right? And that's what we're preaching on today. Now the word Pentecost does not have some kind of a mystical, spiritual meaning. Guess what it means? 50. It's a number word. It means 50. And 50 days after first fruits was the day of Pentecost. All right? The day of Pentecost. It was to be seven Sabbaths. The morrow after seven Sabbaths. It was on a Sunday. Yes, sir. There's a reason we worship on Sunday. In the Old Testament, Sabbath was a rest day. I'm not against that. Ought to, ought to observe that. But worship is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the day of Pentecost come uh, uh, 50 days after that. Now, I'm going to try to skip this this morning because we don't have time. I mean, tell you what, it just seems like no more gets started. It's time to quit. In James chapter 1, James said that you and I should be a type of first fruits, okay? First fruits, and we speak of the resurrection. When we talk about the uh, for, feast of first fruits, the way they were to bring this sheaf of grain and it was the first fruits, the first ripened fruits. And it was a promise of that which was to come. And it was saying that there's more to come. By the way, the best is yet to come. Amen. amen. But you know what you, God said, uh, you know what you do with the grain? Well, I want you to look at this one. Now you, Don Zen, keep your greasy hands off of this. This is homemade bread. And you make bread out of this. I mean, most Americans don't know that, but that's where bread comes from. And there's two loaves here this morning. That's the reason. Because when the day of Pentecost come. They were to bring two loaves of bread along with that lamb offering based upon Calvary. Everything God does based upon Calvary. They made bread out of that grain and they brought two loaves. Now watch this. Let's read in Leviticus chapter 15, 23 verse number 15. The Bible says, and you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, that's that there, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, Sunday, first day of the week, shall you number 50 days. And you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And you shall bring of your habitation two wave loaves. Not grain, but now loaves. Of two tenth deals. And they shall be a fine flour. They shall be baking with leaven. Whoa, what? Wait a minute. God said here, unleavened. Leaven's a picture of sin. He wants that sin out of you. Okay? It's also mentioned that Jesus was sinless. There was no leaven, no sin in him. Now God says, at Pen the Feast of Pentecost, I want you to bring bread that has leaven in it. What's God telling us? Just what I told you a while ago. 
The loaves, I'm just going to get through this quick because we've got to run. These loaves, speaking to Old Testament, New Testament. Bread of life. That's the first application. Second thing is that the church was going to be born out of the first fruits of Christ's resurrection. Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost. The church is consisting of Jew and Gentile. And they're one body. Everything God did back in the Old Testament goes just go straight to the New Testament with it. And he's got it unfolded there for you so you can see it. Jesus is the bread of life. Now watch this very carefully. I want to, I'll tell you this is a blessing. This will make you shout unless you're Episcopalian or something like that. <laughs> he said, I want you to take that grain and I want you to bake lay, loaves with leaven in it. What's the message? The church has sin in it. How many figured that out? Do you know why the church has sin in it? Because it's made up of people who've got sin in them. Paul, the apostle, who wrote most of the New Testament, said toward the latter part of his ministry, I am chief of sinners. He had drawn closer to God in the light of God's truth and righteousness. And the closer he drawed to God, the worse he saw himself. That's why the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. Who sings that? We do. A wretch like me? I want to tell you something right now. Now, this, just hang on. There's lows. God said, I want leaven in them because there is leaven in the church. The church is not sinless because of people we're sinners. Okay, we have our sin nature still with us. But something happened in the making of this bread. Anybody know what happened? It was to make this, after, after it rose, after the leaven puffed it up. Remember the message on leaven puffed up? It was stuck in the oven. And the heat was turned up. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's two or three truths to this, but boy, the main one is this. When Jesus Christ died on that cross for your sins, he took the fire of God's judgment against your sin and he stopped the effect of sin in your life. Yes, sir. You don't stop it yourself. And this is done at the Feast of Pentecost where the Holy Ghost came down. All right? Now, I want to tell you something right now. The secret I'm talking to you more and mentioned earlier is this. If there's anything that the Feast of Pentecost teaches, is that, aren't you glad that's got wrapped on it? Because <laughs> if it was, I'd be the only one who would ever eat this loaf of bread that spit on it. But it's got plastic, amen. amen. Karen might not eat it anyway. She said, I don't know about that. But here's what I'm getting to. I tell you, I bless God for this. Amen. Brother Phil, I've got leaven in me. But when Christ went through the fire of the crucifixion and the wrath of God was on him instead of me, God, Jesus' fire of Calvary stopped the effect of sin in my life. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. I'll tell you what, but I'll tell you something that if we wasn't so sorry and low down backslid, we'd shout over that. Amen. Right. I'll tell you what, God stopped the effect of leaven in your life. When Jesus went through the fire of Calvary, Amen. boy, I'm going to tell you something. Now, let me say in a practical way, what it does for number two, you're going through your Christian life and you say, Oh boy, I don't know why I did what I did. You ever said that? Yeah. And God says, well, because you've got a sin nature in you, but I'm going to deal with you. And so now we're going to put you through some fire. We're going to stop that leaven. You know how most of us stop sinning? God puts enough heat on us. That's a fact. I don't come in church and sit there and go, oh my goodness, this is so good. Boy, I'm really going to take heed to this. No, I go back out and I say, yeah, pretty good message, I guess. But I don't change much. You don't either. You know when you change? is when the fire of God comes 
and the heat comes on your life and the fire persecution and problems and trouble and sickness and sorrow and grief comes to you. And all of a sudden you stop what you're doing and say, you're, you realize my sin is finding me out. God, forgive me. And it gets so hot, you're ready to stop. Yeah. The old black preacher said, amen, right there. Right? It's exactly right. Well, anyway, so let's go now to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to see the manifestation of this. Acts chapter 2. And so what it was, this Feast of Pentecost, it, it represented the birth of the church, Jew and Gentile, going out into the world to give the gospel with the Old and New Testament. Word of God. Does that make sense? Sure it does. <laughs> You're in Hibley land right now. Everything, everything we do makes sense. Amen. No, that's craziness. Amen. All right. Now, Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They ain't never been in church that way since. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Just have a good time this morning. Amen. And then suddenly there came a sound from heaven. There was a rushing mighty wind. And Jesus even told Nicodemus that wind is the type of the Holy Ghost. And it filled all the house they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. So what happened was this fire, and the fire has in the descriptions like a, a flame that does like that on the top. It's set on them. And they're all, watch this phrase, filled with the Holy Ghost. And they begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Why were all these Jews from every, that's what your Bible says, every nation under heaven. Why were they at Jerusalem? They were celebrating the feast of Pentecost. They were supposed to go to Jerusalem and celebrate this feast. While they were there, God fulfilled the prophetic implications of Leviticus 23 and the Holy Spirit of God came down and birthed the church composed of believing Jews and Gentiles, okay? And God gave them power and ability to preach the gospel to everybody. So now, imagine that you have, there's 19 nations just even listed in, in Acts 2. Imagine this, you got all these Jews from all over the world gathered up. And they all speak different languages. It says so. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes down and now they're able to speak the gospel, the word of God, the truth of the word of God to people in their own language that they were born in. Read your Bible. I'm going to say something now, just belt your seat belt up. Tongues is not at all about some kind of babbling at some church service at all. And the reason that most people are afraid of the filling of the Holy Spirit is because they're afraid that that will manifest itself something in that nature. And they sense something's wrong. They just, you know, I don't know what's going on here. And man, I'm telling you something. It's got people to where they'll shy away from the filling and power of the Holy Ghost in their life. Now I'm telling you the truth. Now you listen to the Bible, what it says here about this. Verse number four says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised, the broad multitude came together. They were confounded. Because, why? Every man heard them speak, how? In his own language. Don't you warp that. Don't you twist that to fit your experience. That's what your Bible says. And they were all amazed and marveled and said to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? The men who were speaking in these languages that they did not know who had been supernaturally given to them to preach to these people gathered from all over the world. These men said, aren't these people Galileans? Aren't they from Norwood? <laughs> How are these hillbillies speaking our language? <laughs> I'm just kind of illustrating there, okay? They, it was a miracle. I mean, they said, this guy's speaking in our language and we're hearing the word of God. Right. And it was a miracle of God. Now, verse number, verse number, uh, let's go into verse number eight. And how here, watch this. How here we, every man, 
in our own tongue wherein we were born. You can't get anything out of that other than they say, good land of living, they're speaking our language. How's that happening? Then it's going to list you, I believe 19 different deals there. In verse 11 it says, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, Peter got up then and preached and there were 3,000 people saved. Watch this. First fruits. It's all coming just like God said. The 3,000 saved the day of Pentecost was the, God taking the first fruits of Jesus Christ's resurrection. And you can't be saved without believing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He lived a sinless life. Never said, thought, had attitude, nothing ever sinned. He died for our sins on the cross and vicarious death in our place for our sins. And he rose from the dead. He was buried and on the third day rose from the dead. And in that resurrection power, God then on the basis of that sent the Holy Ghost down so that Jesus, see, he was, just, he was a God man in that place. So the spirit of God was everywhere. There's no place God is not at. Amen. And this morning at churches and meeting places across the world, the Holy Ghost is, re is preaching and talking to people and dealing with people and bringing people into the body of Christ who will repent of their sins and believe on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Peter got done with that. He preached the resurrection of Christ. He preached the gospel that Jesus died in their place. And 3,000 of them got saved. Now watch this. Why did God do that? Because all those men from every nation under heaven were going back to their countries. And they took the gospel message with them back to the land. You say, what does God want in, with us about at Pentecost? He wants you and I to take the Old Testament and the New Testament with the doctrine of the first fruits of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he wants us to bring bread to a starving spiritually, a spiritually starving world and feed them with the word of God and teach them they can be saved through Jesus Christ, that their sins can be forgiven, that their sin can be dealt with, they can be washed by the blood of the lamb, they can be made a child of God, they can have a home in heaven, they can be reunited with God. Amen. Good news. Amen. You don't have to die and go to hell. God died for you. He sent his son for you. You don't have to die and go to hell. And God's not interested in our show business, entertainment, church services. God wants the gospel preached. God wants Christ exalted. God wants people to know they can be washed and forgiven of their sin. And they don't have to go through a bunch of bibbly bobbly booby doo stuff in somebody's church service. I'll tell you what we go. It makes the salvation a riddle. Salvation simple. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I tell you when that man in Acts chapter 16 fell down before Paul and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul didn't say, when I come up here, I'm going to grab you by the back of the coat until you thump and do something. Yeah, right. Paul didn't say, go get dunked in water. Paul didn't say go to church for 15 years. Paul didn't say give to the church. Paul didn't say none of that junk. He said the gospel. And by the way, you know why he gave him the gospel? Because he was already broken and no one knew he needed a savior. And Paul said this statement, don't you ever forget it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the gospel simple. You don't need a bunch of junk. Amen. I'm so sick of all this junk going on in this country, making the gospel out to be a riddle. Now I'm going to give you some things. Oh, my soul. Joel, I want you to come to the piano. I'm going to finish this tonight. Now what I'm getting ready to preach is, is vital to your Christian life. And I'm going to do this tonight after Brother... Uh, Hanger gives his testimony. As I just, there's just something, there's me right now. God said, I'm telling you right now, God's told me, give an invitation, invite people to be saved right now, and you're done preaching this morning. If you're listening to me online, you're here in this building, I'm going to tell you something right now. It's not, it's not a trivial business about your soul. You're going to spend eternity either in hell or in heaven. And it's all dependent on what you do with Jesus Christ. Now, listen to me. Every day of my life seemed like nearly somebody calls me and tells me somebody died. Somebody died. Somebody died. 
I'm going to tell you something. They didn't cease to exist. They went to heaven or they went to hell, depending on what they did with Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to this scripture. This is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life. Watch it carefully. And this life, this eternal life, is in his son. Listen to me carefully. Verse 12. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Watch this. That you may know that you have eternal life. God save you right where you're at right now. There's a man went in the temple in the, old, in the New Testament. The Bible said he just didn't so much as lift up his head. And he said this, God be merciful to me a sinner. That's all I'm going to invite you to do today. Right now. I want one of the verses I'm going to give you this morning, and I'll do it tonight. The Spirit of God does, will not always strive with man. Do you ever think about that? You may be sitting right here listening right now, and the Spirit of God's striving with you. He's trying to tell you, you need to get saved, you need to get saved, you need to get. And the devil's going to come rushing in and say, ah, right, whoa, 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 now. Be careful now. And, he, it, and there's going to be a striving. That striving is God the Holy Ghost bringing conviction on you. Of guilt of sin against a holy God. I'm going to tell you something. You better wake up. This Bible is what defines who God is and what he's like. Not your imagination. Not my imagination. God is holy. God is righteous. God is eternal. God is just. I want to tell you something else. God is loving. But he will not. Do you know God loves everybody? The Bible says so, right? But not everybody's going to heaven. Why? God loves them. Because they will not repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. God is holy. Your sins like mine have to be paid for. And they can only be paid for. There's only one currency heaven deals with. That's the blood of Jesus. I want to ask you this morning, have you ever, have you ever bowed your head and heart before God and said, God, I want to trust your son Jesus as my savior. I want to believe on him that he died in my place for my sins, shed, shed his blood, took your wrath. Let me tell you what God does. The moment you do that, you may not understand this. Bless God, he imparts the righteousness of Jesus Christ to you. That's what the Bible says. Not because you deserved it. That's right. But because of his mercy and his grace and his goodness, God imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to you. And he makes you righteous in his eyes. Because the sentence and the punishment for sin had been paid for in Jesus. He takes your sin and he put it on Jesus. That's why your Bible says this. Who his own self, Jesus, bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He took your sin. And I tell you right now, God wants to save you. Your soul is nothing to play with. Your eternal destination is nothing to play with. Don't you let anybody, your buddies, your friends, your family keep you from being saved as the pianist begins to play wants to bow our heads together if you're here today and you say reg i ain't saved but i sure like to be why don't you just crawl out of that seat right now and say god i want my sins forgiven i'm tired of this nonsense i want to go to heaven i want jesus as my savior would you come out let's stand together this morning you're here today and you've got somebody you're praying for and somebody you love and you want to come and pray for them. You've got needs in your own life. I don't know what it is. I'm just a mailman. God's the one who got the message. You don't have to pay attention to it because of me, but you better pay attention to it because God sent you a message. God wants you to be saved. Would you come this morning? Would you come? Just bow before God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Maybe you're saved, but you've let sin creep in your life and you've gotten yourself off the trail and you need to get right with God and you know it. Would you come? Would you come? Let me tell you something. This church loves you. We're not here playing possum and playing better. We're, we're not playing mind games with you. We're not interested in your money. We're not interested in that. We just want you to know the Lord and walk with God. Once you have a home in heaven, want things to be right between you and the Lord. Once you experience the Christian life. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, nobody looking around. Now listen, they'll be listen to me carefully. I'm starting to preach on the Holy Ghost, the work of the Holy Spirit. And boy, I tell you what, it's a wonderful message. 
He's here in this service right now. But he is pictured in the Bible often as a dove. He will come down and he will deal with you. And then he will, if you refuse it and resist it, in just a few minutes, he will lift. And I'm going to tell you something. That's a dangerous thing. You need to respond while the Spirit of God is dealing with your heart. He's drawing you to Christ right now. I want to ask you, are you here today and say, Reg, just like you, I'm a, I'm a sorry old sinner should go to hell. I've never been saved, but I'd like to be. I'd like to have my sins forgiven. I'd like to know I'm going to heaven when I die. And I'll tell you what, God's a dealing with me right now. Boy, I tell you, I'm a wrestling. Would you remember me in prayer? Now you listen to me. I'm not going to come back to you. I'm not going to embarrass you, not bother you, no way in the world. But I tell you what I am going to do, and 150 people on the other side will help me pray. We're going to pray that the Holy Spirit will lead you to the Lamb of God. And you'd say, pray for me, Reg, by an uplifted hand, quick, up and down, up and down. Pray for me, I'm lost. I'm lost without God. Pray for me. Was there a hand in this building? Anywhere. Raise it quick. Anywhere. I see that hand. God bless you for your honesty and forthrightness. Behold, thou desires truth in the inward parts. In the inward parts. Anyone else? Just lift that hand up and right back down. At least acknowledge it and then put it back down. I want you to be saved. Oh, I see that hand. God bless you, young man. God bless you there. Is there another one right quick? The Holy Spirit, the dove of God, is striving with men right now about their salvation, about their soul. Anybody else? You say, Reg, I'll tell you what, I, I, I kind of bothered because I kind of let on to other folks that I was saved. And if I got saved, they'd know it. Let me tell you something. I've got a son, 30 some years old, called me here a while back and said, Dad, I got saved this morning at my house. I'm glad he wasn't afraid what people think about it. Amen. Let me tell you something. I know what that's like. January the 24th, 1982, and I got saved. I, I, I thought I had everybody thinking I was saved, and I knew it wasn't. One of the hardest things for me to get over was what other people think. I want to tell you something. What came to me, the sweet Holy Spirit said, are you going to go to hell over what people think about you? That's craziness. One more hand. Is there another hand anywhere in this auditorium? Up and then down. I tried to obey the Lord this morning. Pray for you. Anywhere. Another hand. Pray for me. I'm not saved. Now Listen. There's two raised your hands. I'm going to address each one. Heads bowed, eyes closed, please, reverence. Sister, I'm going to invite you to step right to your left to the lady standing left to you and express to her and have her pray with you. Would you do that? Just step over to her and just say, I, I tell you what, I want to get this settled today. Young man, I want you to go to your daddy right now, if you will, and say, Dad, I raise my hand. If you'd like to be say, would you go to your daddy? And say, Daddy, I raise my hand. God bless you, young man. And I want you to do that. I'm just best I know. I'm not asking you to come forward. Not you, know, you go to your daddy. You go step over to that sister right there beside you. Not there may be things I don't know. I, I'm not trying to be the Holy Spirit, but I just want you to know God wants you to be saved. He, trust His Savior. Trust His Son. God save you right where you're at. I tell you what, folks, listen. I, you don't get saved because you went down the aisle. You don't get saved because you knelt at an altar. You get saved when you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. So again, I'm asking. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you'd like to. I want to ask you this question. You say, Reg, I want to tell you right now, I'm a battling. And I ain't got no intention to get saved today. But I tell you what, I'm going to do a lot of thinking about what was preached here this morning about Jesus Christ dying for me. And I'd appreciate you just remember us in prayer. Remember me in prayer. I ain't going to bother you, I'm not going to embarrass you, but just lift up your hand so I know how to pray for you. God, help that man, help that woman. Anybody in the building? I may have missed somebody back over there. If I did, I'm sorry. Anyone else? Anyone else? Father in heaven, there were two hands raised this morning that they need to be saved. First of all, Lord, I appreciate the sweet spirit of truth that was in their hearts. God, I tell you what, we're going to get truthful about things with you. Ain't no hope about nothing. And I pray you help them and encourage them and strengthen them and give them grace. And Lord, may they humble themselves before your mighty hand. And God, let them know they'll never make a wrong turn heading toward Calvary. God, help these people, I pray. Lord, folks on the altar this morning, praying for loved ones, praying for needs in their own life. And I pray you bless them. Answer their prayers, oh God. Touch their hearts, strengthen them, give them, fill them with hope and peace and joy. God, I'm glad to know that as your children, you said if we confess our sins, 
you'd be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, if I understand that right, I, it means every time we sin, we come to you and confess that you'd forgive us. And Lord, I thank you that, Lord, over and over again, I've confessed my sin to you. You've forgiven me, washed me, Lord, and dealt with me as your son. And God, I pray, thank you, praise you for that and thank you for it this morning. Lord, I want to say I love you. Thank you for this time of service we've had today. And God, I pray that you'd help me not to lose the anointing about this message tonight. And Lord, I pray you help my throat. I pray God, give me strength. And God, I pray you bless the camp meeting. Oh God, prepare our hearts to let you have full sway in our souls and our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray. I want you to look up at me right now before I dismiss. Historically, when a church has revival or camp meeting or anything like that, the honest truth about it is we're afraid of what God might do. We're afraid that he'll disturb our nest. We're afraid of what might happen if we totally surrendered to God and totally yielded to his will for our life and let God have his way. I know what that's like. Been there, done that. I just hope God don't move too much. And I want to encourage you this week as we go into camp meeting. I want you to pray at your home. Pray as you're driving. Pray as you're working. And just say, Lord, I surrender all. I don't think this country knows what would happen if a body of believers would say, Lord, Thy will be done and not mine no longer. I give you my life. Give you everything I am ever hoped to be. I ain't going to hold nothing back. God, I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit is so sweet, but he's so gentle. And we can quench him and we can grieve him to where he will not do what he needs to be done. And I've been talking to God. I said, Lord, help me not to be a hindrance to this camp meeting. Just move enough to make it look good, Lord, but not enough to really change our lives. You know? If we're not careful, that's what we're, that's what we're after. And um, I believe God wants to send us a great time. I'm going to tell you the truth about it. You don't know. These, there may be people coming in here, preachers coming in here, who need a touch from God Almighty like we can't believe. And they're hoping and they're praying that God will do something in their hearts and their lives. So I encourage us to be servants, be willing to help people. And I want to encourage everybody. When God did these feasts, they were to lay everything aside for God. They were set this time apart for God. God says, I'll take care of the rest of your stuff. Don't worry about it. You come. And uh, I want to challenge you. Be here every service. You say, well, Reggie, I got, I'll tell you what I do too. I've got all kinds of stuff going on. But you know what I've told my guys I work with? It's all off this week. Amen. We're going to go with God. Yeah, I'll do some things. I'll work like I need to, where I need to. And I've got a revival meeting, all that. But if we will say, Lord, I'm going to lay stuff aside. I'm going to put this camp meeting first. I'm going to let you work in our lives. And we're not going to put other stuff in front of it. And we're going to make an effort to be here, praying at 7 o'clock, fellowshipping, letting God work in us, and see God work a miracle. And I'll tell you something, those we, we, America don't get God back, folks. I tell you, we're sunk, we're sunk, we're sunk. Amen. Well, I tell you what you do. If you'll hug your wife and kiss your daughter and hug your mama or your daddy, you can go home. If you don't, you have to stay here all afternoon. It'd be hot. But uh, hug somebody. Tell them you love them. Tell your family you love them this morning. Would you do that? Amen.